Good evening to all of you. We're very happy to have you here today to answer questions on the special show. Quite a nervous moment, but thank you for doing this. this as far as I'm listen. concerned, this is the revenge that I'm waiting for for the last, <laughs> for the last nearly 20 years. Oh now. dear. <laughs> Let me begin with the question. Why did you write this book at this stage? Are you planning to retire? No, not at all. I don't think the book is a memoir. I think uh, it has some personal perspectives, uh, but that is only because I have uh, based the book on my reporting experiences and my own sense of India. And I have also mapped uh, my own journey and my own process of learning I found that journalism changed me and it pulled me out of a very cloistered, sheltered existence where my opinions were very simplistic. So to that extent, there's bits of me in the book. But I remain a chronicler and this is not a memoir and I am not retiring. If you haven't retired, why would I retire? <laughs> that's, a, that's a lesson for everyone. I don't believe there's any such thing as retirement. Just do different things at different stages well, of your life. I agree. Okay. Now, when uh, Mr. Tucker was asking you about when you write this book, you said you wrote it at night. I have a feeling that there are some more pages. Where are those pages? At the end of every chapter, I get a feeling that there are some more pages. I think you might be right. I think uh, one of the difficult things for a practicing journalist to write a book uh, because may I underline again that I have not retired and I have no plans of retiring, is what you can say, what you can leave out, uh, which confidences you are bound to maintain, for how long do you maintain them, uh, which stories you can tell and which stories you can never tell. And I think uh, that was a difficult balance for me to actually find. And you are right that I won't say there's some pages left. I hope there's another book sometime in me. Well, I hope I don't figure in that either. <laughs> Do you like the references to, your, to you? Well, they're very mild and benign, so, so I, I mean like kind, that. Yes. <laughs> now let me turn to some chapters. And obviously you take yourself seriously. Is that a bad thing? Well, I don't. True. I don't take you seriously, I said. <laughs> I, I, I would hope that there are, that everybody's not like you. And I don't know if I could ever get away with saying I don't take you seriously. I think we have to take you very seriously. Why do you take English television journalism so seriously? The combined TRP of all you guys is less than five. And yet, and yet, isn't it strange that whether it was your party in government or the present party in government, you pay such close attention to not what all of us say, but what the loudest among us say? <laughs> That's because, you write about it somewhere else in yes. your book, we are so English-centric, yes. urban-centric, yes. upper-class-centered, upper-caste-centered, yes. that we tend to believe that yes. people like us yes. coming on television yes. and us make this country. We don't. In fact, what would you say if I told you that opinion in this country is made largely by language journalism in print and television. I would surprise you by saying that I almost agree with you, though not entirely. I think one of the things that I do write about in the book is my own sense of how cloistered, how minuscule the reality that I have experienced is when compared to the larger context outside my immediate reality. And I agree with you that it is a very self-indulgent, a very privileged, a very elitist perspective. That said, I, I do not agree that opinion is driven by language or regional journalism. I think it should be. But I think in this country, even if the TRP collectively of English channels in, is minuscule, that tends to be, that tends to be where policymakers turn their ear. And I would ask you why that is. I'm not sure what you say is right when it comes to state level politics and state level policy making. I would suspect that chief ministers, ministers are more tuning into language channels and language newspapers before they formulate policy. 
I will say that I Take for example yeah. in Kerala. Yes. I think it's the language papers, Matrubumi, Malayala Manorama. I think the government there would perhaps pay more attention to what they say than what any English paper says. No, I don't mean to at all undermine the power of the regional press. In, in fact, one of the things I do feel disabled by uh, as a journalist is that I primarily think in English. I can speak Hindi functionally. I can only speak a smattering of Punjabi, which is my mother tongue technically. But I dream in English. I think in English. So I actually feel that people who are multilingual uh, are much more effect effective in their journalism. And I would really like to reach a larger audience. I do believe the larger audience lies in languages outside of English. But I think that you're not being fully uh, honest when you say that despite its minuscule numbers, it's not the language that's still driving policy in Delhi. And when I say Delhi, I don't mean Delhi as a city, but I mean as the heart of government. I remember when you were minister, you knew what was in every ticker on my channel. Every ticker, every spelling mistake got your right has to mean at least you were watching English language television very seriously. Because I don't know Hindi. <laughs> <laughs> But would you watch more in Tamil or would you watch more if, uh, in if, English? If I was in Chennai, if I was based in Tamil Nadu, I would certainly watch more Tamil television and read more Tamil papers. Anyway, the point but I'm I take your point. is, I do take your have, point. You, have you ever thought of Hindi journalism or say Punjabi journalism? I have thought of Hindi journalism. My Punjabi is not good enough. Uh, my Hindi, it's one of the gifts that actually I think journalism has given me. I think because I met so many people who did not in fact speak English and at least in the north of India who spoke in Hindi, I think speaking to so many people my Hindi improved. And I really wish I could do a show in Hindi. I really wish I was fluent enough or proficient enough. I just don't have the confidence uh, because it comes back to the language you think in and dream in. And unfortunately, we are what's called the Baba Log. It's a phrase used for your party sometimes. And we are bound by our Angrezi pun, as they say. No, no. I want to lead this to another question, the more yes. serious question. Yes. What, according to you, is the difference between writing for print journalism and speaking for television journalism? It's, it's what made writing this book so difficult for me. Because for 20 years, I have primarily been a television journalist. Unlike most people in my industry, I'm a child of television. Television was my first job. I did not come from print to television. And the key difference is that in television, the visual is already there. So your writing tends to be more metaphorical. It tends to be more symbolic. So for example, if I were writing about the tsunami, the visual of a child's shoes or a clock floating in water would already be there. And I could write a sentence that said, time has stood still. But if I wrote in print and there was no visual, and if I said time had stood still in the context of the tsunami, nobody would understand that. So I had to really, really struggle a bit uh, with making that shift from writing for television, which is what I'm accustomed to, to writing for print, which requires uh, a much more imaginative, descriptive uh, recreation of events. Let me tell you what I think the difference is. In print journalism, the feedback for the author is after 24 hours. In yes. television journalism, yes. in the Twitter age, yes. the feedback is instant. And would I be right if I said that that largely colors what you guys say on television? That the feedback is instant, you don't want to get a negative feedback, and that colors what you guys say on television? You would not be fully right. I think there is a grain of truth, if one were to be completely honest, about the fact that what television did to print, the age of Twitter has done to television. In other words, just like TV was disruptive for the world of print, social media has been disruptive for our world. Many of us initially, at least, were not used to this volley of feedback. But I think over time we have understood that Twitter feedback is very well politically organized. And it's politically organized now by all parties. It may have begun with the BJP, then the Aam Aadmi Party catching up. I think the Congress has finally caught up as well. And what I find really disturbing is that these days, if you do not confirm the existing prejudice of your viewer, you're immediately labeled biased. Where I do agree with you is that I think it requires a very, very thick skin and a very, very strong character to not look to be popular on social media and to say what you think. For yeah, example, the question really is, does this instant feedback affect your integrity? 
not mine. I'm not talking about you as you. I think it's a danger. I think it's a problem. I think it's a problem particularly for young journalists who are just starting out, who may be absolutely staggered by the kind of pressure. And it's almost like a mob. It is like an online mob that is pressuring you to take one position or the other. And I believe that if I did not have 20 years of experience, I would have been much more impacted by, if I were a journalist coming of age in this age of social media, I think, it's a, I think it's a dangerous influence. Take, for example, the amendments we made to the Juvenile Justice Act. Yes. It was largely driven by uninformed people. And the pressure was so much that political parties changed their originally correct opinion. That even if you amend the law, the amended law can't apply to the juvenile who had already committed the offense. But yet, the parties were virtually railroaded into amending the law. How can parties be railroaded? This is, this precisely, is the part I don't understand. Precisely you say we impact, don't matter, but impact, yet you say policy yeah, is railroaded of, by us. No, I'm, not talking about, I'm talking about English, versus, yeah, but yeah. take all journal, all, all channels together. Yes. All channels, more or less uniformly, more or less uniformly, all the reporters, all the correspondents, all the anchors, more or less uniformly said, you must amend the law. I think was not everyone trying to be on the right side of quote unquote public opinion. That's the danger of instant feedback. I think populism. Whereas uh -huh. most of the articles that appeared in newspapers correctly interpreted the constitution. I would, I would not agree. I think populism is a danger, but I think populism can be a danger in any medium. It can be a danger in television. I almost think populism in television is more amplified than it is on Twitter, for example, uh, because it's more immediate. You're sitting there in your drawing room watching somebody or the other make that point. I, I agree with you that what we have become as a, as, as a society, as journalists, is less considered. I, I don't believe that's a function of the medium. I think that's a function of the age we live in, that our public discourse is much more polarized, that we're all under pressure to take sides, that some of us, for example, me, on this change in the Juvenile uh, Justice Act, I was very ambivalent. The reasonable part of me felt that we must treat children as children and we must stick to the law that exists. The more emotional part of me felt, okay, is it that wrong to give the Juvenile Justice Board the chance to decide whether this 17, any 17 year old in the future, not this particular one in the nearby case, was of adult mind when he committed this crime. I was ambivalent, but I find there is a shrinking space to reflect your own ambivalence and explore it. And I agree with you that that's a tragedy of our times. I think the tragedy is compounded by the fact that the reporter, the anchor, is wants to be in the right side of the instant feedback. I'm most often on the wrong side of the instant feedback. I can, I can promise you that. And, uh, and I can be extremely stubborn, but I do agree that we're all human. I'm sure even you as a politician, when you get instant feedback on Twitter, how do you feel? You're on Twitter now, how do you feel when it's I all negative? I, I, I follow a Mr. Modi's style of communication, strictly one way. So there, is, so there is something you think you should emulate in Mr. Modi. Strictly one way. Well, then we, the we finally found something in common between the two of you, self-professed. So that's interesting. OK. Let's move on now. Yes. Now, you wrote about the Cargill War. Yes. You wrote about Operation Parakram. Both were very different kinds of uh, engagement of the Indian Army. One was an active war, one was a preparation to war. But not many people know that more people died in Operation Parakram than in the Kargil War. Yes. So when you speak glowingly in terms of Kargil War, why did you pull back your punches? Why did you not condemn what they did in Operation Parakram? But I do make the point that more people died in Parakram, most not, of them in demining, yes. in removing the mines. But you don't condemn that mobilization as a knee-jerk reaction. Because I do not think it my place to necessarily know what a government should do in the position of 
a parliament of a country which is an act of well, war. You're not being reporting attacked. in the book. You're commenting. I know, and I and I ask myself today because I did interview Brijesh Mishra a few weeks before he died, and I and I did ask him why the mobilisation was was essential and was it a mistake? And he seems to believe that the pressure on Pakistan to alter policy for Parvez Musharraf to come in later and promise the territory would not be used for terror groups was a consequence of this build up. Do I agree? I would say no. I would say that was a waste. But in, but in retrospect, we know that was completely mis misplaced. But judgment. can we ever know? For example, I see it one four. I, you know, you you as Home Minister gave a very considered uh, response on this. Would you have, if you were Jaswan Singh or L K Advani, released Masood Azhar? And you know, in Pathan Court's context, that that becomes very relevant today. And isn't the honest answer that we can't be sure? We we actually don't know, even as observers or chroniclers that we can't be sure what governments should do in these situations. Look, IC-184 is not the same as Operation Parakra. IC-184 was an evolving situation where nearly 200 lives were at stake. Operation Parakra was a response to seven security personnel being killed in an attack on parliament. So I think having rightly paid tribute to the valor of our soldiers in the Kargil War, I think you, my view is that you pulled your punches on Operation Parakra. Do you believe it was a mistake? It's a terrible mistake. It's a wasteful, wasteful exercise. We wasted, we wasted um, inventory, we wasted ammunition, uh, we spent huge amount of money, and we got zero returns out of that. But then the suggestion would be that build up without war is a waste. So are you suggesting that the country should have gone to war? No. Build up without war is not a waste. Well, again, I'm asking the questions, OK? <laughs> oh, build old, up, old habits die hard. Build up, build up is right, provided you know what your objectives are. And none of the objectives were spelt out, and none of the objectives were achieved. Let's move on. So, but, uh, but allow, allow yes. me one, one question just to explore further what you've said. You were Home Minister right in the aftermath of 26-11. We're in Mumbai. Did your government at the time never consider a, a, a build-up of troops? Because that was certainly the information at that time, and no, it's not classified to ask about it today. Well, in a sense, it still remains classified. I know you guys were asking the question. Uh, It was considered, but uh, I think the conclusion was the right conclusion. Which was? That we do not repeat an Operation Parakra. So it was considered? It was considered, like any kind of a knee-jerk reaction, it was considered. But were troops moved? Yeah, well, I can't answer that. But the conclusion was right. And we'll, exp we'll talk about it after some time. We're still too close to that. It's 2008. We are only in 2016. So it'll be in your book. <laughs> well, uh, if I can keep awake at night like you and write a book, <laughs> I go to bed early. Let's move on. There are, for example, you, you, you speak uh, quite uh, movingly, and I compliment you for your candor about your childhood experiences, especially the uh, offensive uh, experiences that you went through. And you rightly say that 70% of uh, girl children go through some kind of uh, experience like that. Uh, it's true, not only in India, it's true perhaps of many countries of the world, perhaps not the more mature, um, uh, advanced countries, but certainly it's true of the US, it's true of many other countries. Uh, now did it uh, color your view of men as such? Yes, I think it did. Uh, I think for anyone who's experienced child sexual abuse, which I do write about in the book, and um, first, I just want to say why I wrote about it, because I, I did not want this book to be about me. But at the same time, gender and issues around gender has been one of the most passionate uh, causes. It, 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 it's something I feel very strongly about. 
And when I was writing the chapter on the place of women, I felt it would be extremely hypocritical of me to talk about how other women or other young people struggle uh, with the stigma or the conspiracy of silence around sexual abuse without breaking that silence myself. So I think I did struggle with confronting that memory again. As I said, it was buried somewhere and it had to be excavated. But as a child, I did not understand its impact. But when you grow up and you realize that you feel intuitively cynical, you feel cynical about relationships, you feel cynical about men, I, you feel cynical about sexual relationships, you can now, I mean as a 40-something adult, I can now trace it back to my experience with child sexual abuse, with my experience with uh, domestic violence in one of my early adult relationships in college. And I do believe that as a woman who does many programs on this issue, if I did not confront it and if I did not write about it, it would make me intellectually dishonest, which is why that very difficult decision, do I put it in, do I put it out? And I did put it in. And has it impacted me? I think I understand today that it has. No, the two experiences were very different. Yes. One was as an unsuspecting child. Yes. One was as a, a willing adult. But not willing. I mean, no one's... Well, no the relationship was willing. Yes. But the violence... The violence was yes. not willing. Yes. So I think the two are very different experiences. In a way, has, have both experiences colored your thinking of men? Exception, of course, being Farooq Abdullah. <laughs> no, well, I've just known Farooq Abdullah a long time. Well, you confess that he flirted with you. No, I confess. <laughs> okay, so now we have to segue out for those who haven't read the book. Uh, and I will come back to your question. But just for those who are not familiar with what Mr. Chitambaram is referring to, I was a young reporter covering the elections in Jammu and Kashmir and uh, Farooq Abdullah is so irreverent that he can just stump you with his absolute, uh, I mean he's a rascal, there is no other word for him, he's a rascal. And uh, he's a friend of mine which is why I'm calling him a rascal with affection. And uh, at that time there was a big rumor that his son and he were not on the best of terms. And I, I was on live television and they were just coming out of voting in this polling booth in Kashmir and I ran to them and I was very excited, oh the father and son are together and they're not getting along and this picture is going to speak a thousand words and I said, you know, the rumor is that you two are not getting along. And he said in Chase to Urdu and this went on television, Afwa to ye bhi hai ki hum tumhare aashik hai, which in translated in English means, well rumor also has it that I'm your suitor. And you know, you think of me, some young 20-something, Farooq Abdullah, chief minister, and I had to just laugh. I mean, there was nothing to be done but to be laughed. But it was an example that I placed in the book of how the perils of live television. But to come back uh, to, your more, to your much more somber question, does the experience of child sexual abuse um, alter your perception of men? I think consciously, I would say no, and I would say subconsciously it has. And I think it makes you suspicious. I think it makes you less trusting. I think it, uh, it, it, it surfaces in ways that, that actually follow you into not just your young adulthood, but into your middle age. You're, I mean, even today at the age of 44, I would say it impacts me in ways that I'm still understanding. Maybe because I'm finally grown up enough to actually be able to confront it without shying away from it. So yes, I think it has uh, subconsciously altered my opinion of men. Then, of course, you write about many other things. For example, you write about um, Naxalism, you write about terror. In which I also write about you. Yes. Uh, actually, there are three major themes that you cover. One is uh, the oppression of Dalit, mm -hmm. the caste oppression. One is terror. And one is Maoism. Naxalism. I think each one is a very powerful chapter. Each one raises a number of questions, leaves a number of questions unanswered. I think it's worthwhile to explore each one of them. Take, for example, caste oppression. Now, the famous uh, verdict that was given in the rape of a scheduled caste woman Banwari Devi. The judge said that he acquitted the accused and one of the grounds he gave was that uh, no upper caste man will touch a lower caste woman and therefore the yeah. story of rape is wrong. Yes. Now clearly that judge should have been impeached. You believe the judge should have been impeached? I, I agree with you. Not for his wrong judgment. 
but for his absolutely casteist approach that no upper caste man would ever rape a Dalit because she's an untouchable. I mean, what an absurd proposition. But why is there no anger in this country? I'm asking you as a citizen. Why is there no anger in this country when such incidents are reported virtually every day? Is there no rape of a Dalit woman by an upper caste man today? There is. There are many, in fact. So one of the ironies for me is that I started my profession reporting on the story of Bhavri Devi, uh, a, village, a villager, a, a, a self-help, who used to work with a self-help group in Rajasthan, gang raped, as you described, by upper caste men, and then banished into exile to the edge of the village for actually trying to fight them. No, you must tell them why she was gang raped. She objected to the proposed marriage of a nine-month-old girl to a one-year-old boy in her village and said, I'm a government um, sevika or whatever. Yeah, satin. Yeah. Satin. And therefore, this marriage cannot take place. This marriage is illegal. For that crime, she was raped by the father of that boy yes. along with other men. Yes. And they were all belonged to the, the so-called yeah. upper caste yes. of that village. Yes. That's the context. Yes. In that context, a judge in this country pronounced a judgment acquitting them and the first reason he gives is no upper caste man will ever rape a Dalit woman. Yeah. And what is also ironic is that this woman Bhavri Devi is still waiting for justice more than two decades later. But it is because her case went all the way to the Supreme Court that what we now know as the Vishakha guidelines which were the first set of guidelines against uh, how to deal with sexual harassment at the workplace, that's how the Supreme Court framed them. Whereas Bhavri's own case remains absolutely unaddressed. And to answer your question, I do believe that sadly, our rage is urban. Our rage, this happened with, I was here reporting on 2611, and of course it was an act of war. But just like in 2611, because it was we, it was we, we in the cities, who, you know, we finally came face to face, in a sense, with the specter of terrorism. We, the relatively rich, well-off people, similarly, sexual violence, um, in the way that it galvanized the country in the aftermath of Nirbhaya, whom we can now call Jyoti because her mother has taken her name. Very powerful moment. I am grateful as a woman for that moment. I believe it was an inflection point, but I have to concede that it, the fact that we could never get as angry about any other case, including Bhavri Devi, reflects that we, the people, when we express rage, we maybe humanly do it when we can identify. We could identify in the Delhi case with the young woman who, took, who went to see a movie with her friend and took a bus back. You know, we could identify. And hopefully, hopefully, after that, Stories like Bhavri Devi are no longer on the margins of media and public attention. Today, sexual violence is a mainstream story. There was a time when I joined journalism that only women reported on sexual violence. It was considered a soft story. It was never the lead story on the 9 p.m. news. So I will say that while there is a class bias, I do believe what happened on 16th December in Delhi a few years ago changed the way we look at gender. And maybe, maybe it will bring Bhavri's case back to the headlines, though I do admit that that has not happened thus far. See, even the Vishaka guidelines yes. apply only to formal office settings. They don't apply in a village. They don't apply on a farm. Yes. But Theoret even in offices, we have offices yeah. that have not framed them. So Vishaka guidelines are again very urban-centric Vishaka guidelines, and it applies to organized sector. It doesn't apply to the unorganized sector. Yes. The problem is most of these crimes take place out in the countryside, in the unorganized sector, among people who don't work in formal workplaces. But may, I, I agree, but may I ask you a question? A lot of sexual violence takes place actually in what women know as the so-called circle of trust. Um, a lot of sexual violence happens in marriages. And yet, every single party, including yours, was unanimous in not recognizing marital rape against the recommendations of the Justice Varma Commission. Looking back, and because you can speak more freely today, do you believe that was correct? 
Well, uh, again, marital rape was considered when we were amending the law. But opinion was very sharply divided. Largely because of the manner in which the dowry death penal provision has been invoked and applied in this country. See, there is a new section has been added on dowry death. It was added about 20 years ago. Dowry death. If a young bride dies within, I think, seven years of marriage under circumstances which are suspicious, yes. then the presumption shifts to the, the onus of proving shifts that the innocent the shifts to the family, the man, yes. etc. But that section, we know, has been grossly misused in this country after some time. Grossly misused. And, um, More misused than used, well, I don't used know the for numbers. women who need help? I don't know the numbers. It has been used, but it has been misused. So that really colored the dis discussion when we discussed marital rape. That while marital rape is indeed an offense, it must be punished. Is there the danger that the section will be misused in order to... But that's true for any law, right? It is true for any law, but not it's all... It's true for domestic violence. Not, not all laws are misused violence. to that extent, but some sections are grossly misused. What do you... What do you I mean, I know I've switched roles here, but what do you think personally? Do you, do you, believe, do you believe that a liberal, country, a liberal modern country cannot look at marriage as a license to rape? No, I don't think anyone has a right to force his wife to submit to sex against her wish. I'm clear about that. Uh, but at what point will it become rape? I don't know. See, the definition of rape now is very different. Yes. It's no longer the classical definition of rape. Anyway, we're getting into uh, very technical areas of both so law So you don't and believe law. there should be a law yet? No, no, there should be a law, but it requires very careful drafting to decide at what point of time the insistent, insistence of the husband uh, upon his wife to submit to sex becomes rape. Uh, I think uh, uh, people who are married for long will know that. I have to, I have to say that I, I find it absolutely, I know. I, absolutely as a, as a, appalling that we a, don't have a law a, that recognizes yeah, marriage. As a, as, a, as, a, as a statement that sex can only be by consent, and if even there is the slightest unwillingness mm. to uh, indulge in sex, it, it is wrong. That is, as a statement, it is unexceptionable. But at what point does it become, quote unquote, rape? Because of the definition of rape now. See, the very same law amended rape to mean, as you have said yes. in your book, yes. very uh, much wider definition. Therefore, I think when you define rape, and then you define marital rape, you see the difficulty of the draftsman there. Well, we'll agree to disagree. Yeah, I think yes. No, you don't have to disagree with me. You'll have to agree with me that the, there's a serious difficulty for the draftsman. Having defined rape in a particular manner, how do you then define marital rape? Be that as it may. Let's move on. The next area we're talking about is terror. Hmm. Now, you have seen terror firsthand. You have seen, you have cradled the uh, injured journalist in your arms. You have seen the other guy killed in terror. Now, how do you see victims reacting to terror? You have seen them at close quarters. How do you see observers reacting to terror? How do you see uh, people who are far removed and very secure reacting to terror? I think the people who are far removed and very secure uh, still tend to believe that it's not real till it happens to you. Uh, I, I worry at how cheap life has become, especially in India. Uh, I think we are now so brutalized and numbed by repetitive images of terrorist violence that we move on very quickly. We have, you know, there may be a lot of noise in television studios over Pathan Court, but I believe that we have moved on. As, as, as a society, we're not talking about it every day. Uh, it, it gives you an example that when you're far removed from it, you believe it's somebody else's reality. When you are observers, but closer to the theater of terror, one of the very 
interesting and paradoxical things I have observed is that victims of terror want a voice in the aftermath of a terror strike and sometimes even while it's unfolding because they have lost people or they have been grievously uh, affected themselves and they want a voice in the narrative. But the observer, the observer wants television to provide a moment, especially television, to provide a moment of detachment and detached calm. So when you bring the fest, you know, when you, when you expose the, the sort of very naked anxiety or fear or grief or sense of devastation of a victim to the observer who may be watching this unfold in the same city in his or her uh, uh, drawing room, they tend to be rattled and they turn their anger, I've noticed, on the media. Why do you have to, why are you giving a voice to these people right now is a question I get asked a lot. And I'm not saying that the media or myself have never made mistakes or never made the wrong judgment call. But I believe that you cannot take away the agency of people to decide for themselves whether they want to speak. And if they want to speak and it's not hurting anything operational, if it's their story. Like I, I, I still remember, uh, you know, Sabina Saikia, the, the well-known journalist, being uh, she was inside, she was inside uh, the hotel when 2611 unfolded. I mean, Debu is here. We all remember those times. But Shantanu Saikia, her husband, came to me and, and he said, "I don't know if I will ever meet her again. I have no idea if she can watch television. Will you please take me on your show so I can say something? Maybe she'll hear it." Maybe she won't, but this is my message to her. And I saw no reason to not give him that space. Whereas a lot of people who watched it had very mixed feelings. And they, and they believed that maybe that was not the moment when the siege was not yet lifted uh, to give that space to grief, to anxiety, to farewells. I still believe on balance that as long as the operational detail is protected and nothing is given away operationally, one should not sanitize, one should not sanitize the truth. And one of the things that George Bush, for example, had to answer for is when the coffins came back from Iraq, television in America never showed it. And so the full horror of the war and the cost of war never came home. And I, do, I don't agree with that. People say, oh, they were so responsible, American journal journalism or American television networks, they never showed the coffins. I disagree. I think it played into the government narrative to help sanitize uh, Bush's decision. Now let me give you the other point of view. I moved to the Home Ministry immediately yes. after 2611. Yes. And I led the post-event analysis of what happened. Mm. Now I think television made a serious mistake yes. in telecasting live the operations that were being conducted by the NSG after, mind you, after they had been warned Not that the sure. terrorist in the hotel were watching it on television. And they knew exactly, in fact, the repelling of yes. the NSG commandos yes, was the watched by the terrorists. Okay. Did because you showed it. And they knew that the NSG commandos were repelling down. No, you make your point. I'll, I'll respond to it. Well, that's a fact. Uh, so I would say to that, that the media did make, we, the media, did make an inadvertent mistake in initially telecasting the, op the, the coverage live, absolutely, without knowing that the handlers were watching it. And the actual repelling, I specifically remember on NDTV, was with a 20-minute delay. So that particular, by that day, we had understood. However, it was a mistake. It was definitely a mistake, but I also think, with, with due respect, Mr. Chidambaram, that it was a gigantic mistake for nobody in the government to simply pick up the phone to 10 editors and say, just don't do this live, it's, it's, it's hurting the operation. We did not, I went back after five days in Mumbai and the facts from the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting had come to our office on the third day of the siege when it was almost ending. So we definitely made a mistake. An inadvertent, no, unwitting glad. mistake. That that but I think communication, point. no government seems to learn. No, I agree. We've seen it in Pathan Court. For the first day and a half, we had no communication. We were almost repeating the mistakes of 2611. So we made a mistake, but I think so did the government. I agree. I don't have to defend that. No, this. and I'm not defending no, the I was not a player. And I, I, I am not and defending I the mistake we no, made. I think we, we move on to a more serious issue. No mm -hmm. city in India has been affected by terror than Mumbai. More effective, yes. More effective. The largest number of terror attacks on any city took place in Mumbai. In fact, I think uh, 
if you leave out some of the Middle East countries, Baghdad and Tehran and others, I don't think there's any other city anywhere in the world which has been more affected than Mumbai. We've had um, the Mumbai train blasts, we've had um, 26-11, we had the uh, Zaveri Basar attacks later, we've had more terror attacks in this city. But even this city, even this city does not apply enough pressure on the government to quickly upgrade its capacity to fight terror. For example, take the coastal police. And only two weeks ago, we found a story in one of the newspapers that one of these coastal police stations was nothing more than a shack with just four poles and a, and a piece of tarpaulin on top of it. And that, they called it a coastal police station. Money has been given. Equipment has been given. The blueprint has been given. Yet a state government simply does not put up the coastal police station it promised to put up after 26-11. Why is the city so silent? Why is the city so patient? And why is the city uh, so um, inactive? And I so wish that we'd stop saying resilient for everything that you've described. That's, it's, it's become a worn out cliche to actually explain a city that has no option but to get up on its feet and live again and work again and catch that local train again. But do you know that when, when uh, Prithvira Chavan was chief minister and the most recent Zaveri Bazaar blast happened and I remember being here and going to interview him and do you know what he told me that he said he could not get through to his top police officer because the phones would not work and the wireless system did not work for the first 15 minutes. And the thousands of CCTV cameras that were meant to be procured in the aftermath of 2611 had still not been procured because no bureaucrat was willing to sign the file. Partly, so partly, because, partly because the media and the PILs have put so much fear in the bureaucrat. But how can we risk lives based on, on the fear of the I don't defend what. In fact, my complaint to state governments after 2611 has been, despite all the urgency that we showed, state governments were simply not responding fast enough. We set up hubs, we bought equipment, and all kinds of things, yet the state governments were not responding fast enough. But the point I'm making is slightly different. The point I'm making is one of the reasons, one of the reasons why there's so much inaction and so much delay in government, so much delay in government, is a kind of atmosphere that has been created that the best decision is no decision. But for a, if a government gets... No, no, you are, I'm asking you. It's a counter uh, question. You, have you not contributed to this best decision is no but, decision? But I atmosphere. find it extraordinary that the explanation for the paralysis and the bureaucracy is because the media makes a noise. Not the media alone. I'm saying media also. But today you've created a situation where, created a situation where the, the best decision is take no decision. How have we created this decision? Because I thought the original definition of leadership is men and women who could lead, not men and women whose decisions are based on the 9 no, no. p.m. news. Are you not admitting, do, do you deny that the media, PIL, and, uh, and some other NGO activity have created an atmosphere where very few people have the courage to take the decisions and most people simply say, let's not take the decision. I believe that outrage is cheap. I believe that there is a, what I call a two-minute Maggie Noodle kind of instant judgment. I have already conceded that that has hurt our public discourse terribly. But I do not believe that that can become an excuse for bureaucrats to not commission CCTV cameras, for the chief minister to not be able to reach his police officer because the wireless system doesn't I'm work. I'm not defending that. All I'm trying to say is every decision is questioned, every action is suspect, every note sheet can be distorted, every government order can be questioned on its motives, and therefore have we not created, have we not created, all, to, all of us together, have we not created an atmosphere where people are simply afraid to take a decision? We obviously have created that atmosphere, but I think it's an un, 
incomprehens I understand the fear to some extent but I do not understand the fear when lives are involved I understand that the debate around transparency and governance has got shrill some would say it was a needed corrective and India will find its balance somewhere that we went from a period of entrenched corruption so you needed that level of noise to bring back the sunshine as the best disinfectant uh, I do agree we may have lurched to an extreme that we have easy quick judgments that we condemn people especially in our trade we uh, treat television studios as kangaroos courts I, I agree with that I'm personally extremely uncomfortable with that trend in television but I cannot accept that it can become the basis for jeopardizing the lives of Indian citizens. That's the only dis the disagreement that when taken to that level, I would not agree. Let's move on. Let's yeah. move on to Naxalism. Yes. Now, that's where you make an honorable mention to me, honorable reference to me. <laughs> you, dis you more or less disapprove of the line I took. More or less. Disapprove of the line I took. I, okay. More or less. And you quote approvingly Sunita. Sunita being the widow of a police yes. officer who was killed by Naxos. And who's, you seem to think that development is the answer to Naxalism. I don't disagree with you. But is development the only answer to Naxalism? In that chapter, did you correctly understand the character of the Naxalite movement? Understand the character of the Naxalite leaders? They have held women as slaves and captives. Their children study in the best schools. Yet they kill and shoot and uh, commit all kinds of depredations. For what? For bringing about an overthrow of the established system of government. Have you heard President Obama yesterday? Yes. What he spoke about terrorism, but maybe not in that um, very high-pitched uh, tone, would it not by and large apply to the kind of menace that we face in Naxal affected territory? I believe you misunderstand my position. I think my position, if I may draw a parallel with Jammu and Kashmir, would be that of course there is terror that must be fought with the apparatus available to the security establishment. Absolutely. I am not an apologist. Uh, for terror, I am no Arundhati Roy. I do not believe that this, these, are, these, are, these are Gandhians with guns. Absolutely not. Um, I believe that there is a great brutality in Maoist terror. However, I believe that every failure of governance, every failure of local empowerment only exacerbates the problem. Just like in Jammu and Kashmir, every rigged election, every human rights violation only exacerbates the problem. That does not take away from the reality of terror. It does not take away from the reality of foreign funding for this terror, whether in Naxal uh, terrorism or in Jammu and Kashmir. But it does, not, it does not mean that the approach can be purely militaristic it, or it can be purely security no, oriented. I think, I think, I think, I think you're, you're, you're looking at two very different situations. Uh, one is Jammu and Kashmir, where there is a popular movement, yes. movement towards autonomy, independence, yes. azadi, whatever. The other is where a group of people, self-styled uh, Maoists, who believe in the overthrow of the established system of government, taking to arms mm. and terrorizing the people mm. and committing all kinds of crimes. In this, we are talking about the second situation. Now. You seem to think that development can take place before the people who can bring about development can even enter that area. No doctor can go there, no nurse can go there, no teacher can go there. You build a school, they blow up the school. You build a road, they mine the road. Therefore, it's not the first step, first to secure the place before you bring about development. I don't disagree. Oh, you I, do think it has to be a I think it has to be a simultaneous process. Well, I think then that page needs to be replaced. But now. maybe you could talk a bit Maybe you could talk a bit about that famous comment that you made about how even being the Home Minister, you believed you had a limited mandate. You were not free to pursue the Naxal policy that you wanted. You were not free to amend the Armed Forces Special Powers Act in Jammu and Kashmir. You were not free to pursue the policy you wanted on Naxals. You were the Home Minister. Who was stopping you? Maybe you could finally tell us and, I could, I, and it could be the next chapter of my next book. We did not have 282. The highest number we had is 201. But you were, you were stopped by your own colleagues in the cabinet and by Mrs. Gandhi. 
No, I'm not who taking... Who had a much more extreme no. version of the view you think I have. I don't think so. I don't think so. And I'm not taking any names. The point I'm making is that opinion on these issues will always be divided. But eventually, one has to take, as you said, a leadership position. You have to take a leadership position. I agree. Let's move on. Yeah. Now, obviously, Mr. Modi doesn't like you. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't think Mr. Rahul Gandhi likes me either. I'm, I'm in a very special position. I have, mani I have managed Mr. to piss off Mr. Modi and Mr. Rahul Gandhi. We are talking about Isn't Mr. Modi. Isn't that I'm an equal opportunity offender? No, it is not. We are talking about Mr. Modi. Yes, do he you, doesn't like him. Do you like him? It's not a journalist's job to like or dislike politicians. Next you'll ask me, do you like me? Well, I know you don't, but... <laughs> no, it is not a journalist's job to like or dislike politicians. No, why don't you... It's not a journalist's job. A journalist's job is to chronicle what she sees. And it is a journalist's job to believe that a, no, no, a particular you... leader's response to an issue may be right. A particular leader's response to an issue may be wrong. No, no, you write, you write uh, uh, very uh, correctly that... There are only two journalists who were not invited to the tete-a-tete uh, -tete with the Prime Minister, one of them being you. And the other was Rajdeep. The other was Rajdeep. Yes. Sad, uh, Rajdeep Sardesai. Yes. What I would like to know is, what is your assessment of the Prime Minister after 20 months? I believe the fact that the Prime Minister does not like me because he believes I was biased when he was Gujarat Chief Minister in my reportage of the 2002 riots, which I suspect is the same thing he holds against Rajdeep, should not and does not impact my capacity to observe him quite objectively. And my objective assessment would be, and I have written that in the book, that I think Mr. Modi as Prime Minister will confound both his critics and his supporters. I do not believe him to be ideological. I believe that he, is, he has a capacity for being more of a pragmatist than a polemicist. I think we've seen that in his Pakistan <coughs> policy. What his rhetoric was is very different from the policy he pursues today. And I believe that he will, he, he is seeking a larger legacy as all prime ministers do. And we will be surprised by him. And we continue to be surprised by him. A lot of people who voted for him are surprised. You're now wearing your Congress hat. No, no. Now, you see <laughs> on Twitter, on Twitter you'd be called a biased anchor right now. <laughs> And may I just say that while Mr. Modi doesn't like me, one of the common things that has happened to our politics, uh, you know, I, I, I do want to make this point to you, Mr. Chidambaram, is that politicians have found a way of talking to people bypassing mainstream media. And that applies for Mr. Modi, but it also applies for the Gandhi family. It applies for many other politicians. And I believe, therefore, that cultural, that, that interface of question and answer between the media and the po political establishment across parties is reducing. And I think that's very dangerous for our democracy. Well, I, I don't want to push you further. I know that um, the government is here to stay for another 40 months, and uh, you perhaps will maintain 40 fence. months. And after that? Well, after that, there will be an election. And you believe the result will be different? I believe we are a democracy, isn't it? <laughs> I want to ask the final question. Yes. You talk about your middle class upbringing. Yes. And even the very rich in this country call themselves upper middle class. You know that. <laughs> you talk about your middle class upbringing, uh, how you uh, had to uh, ride on your then boyfriend's scooter of 20 years old, um, how you were pushed and shoved in buses, etc., etc., and you were embarrassed when your father brought back a seven-year-old Benz car. Well, I, I, we, we told everybody we had a Fiat. Yeah, you had a Fiat. Yes. Uh, what are you now? I wouldn't, I would say I'm upper middle class economically, but I would say in my values, I upper am still upper middle class as upper middle, middle class, class progressive. Or as upper middle class as I defined upper middle class. I don't know how you define it. I said even the very rich call themselves no, upper middle class. No, I'm certainly nowhere close to any, I, I, you know, I, when I entered journalism, my salary was 8,000 rupees a month. And I know. In my first brief, I, I got 150 rupees. Well, you're just much older, so that's just inflation and salaries changing with that. Journalists did not become journalists to earn money. I did not become a journalist to earn. I did not, and we did not earn money for the longest time. I did time, not become a lawyer to earn, earn money. money. 
So how how upper middle class are you then? I, I <laughs> don't don't tell us all that story. You didn't join journalism I to make money. I did not. Money. You joined journalism, journalism to embrace poverty. Journal no. I I joined jo journalism. Journalism is not the Ramakrishna mission. But journalism was not a well-paying job when I became a journalist. Today it is. Today it is, but that's not when I joined. No. Therefore, what I want to know is after that chapter where you talk about how uh, you characterize people as a dabba class and then your class and the rich yes. class just want to know what you are today and the further question has it changed your world view no i think You're i'm still very middle class view. i think inside me there is a kind of childish embrace of the same middle class progressive values that my parents brought me upon i i recognize it to be childish i recognize that there's a mismatch between the life i live and my insistence that i'm middle class i recognize that but i do believe that middle class and and coming of age on the cusp of liberalization which is when i became an adult in the in the 90s uh, is you know it, it there was a kind of healthy contempt or embarrassment about wealth and i think i think it's okay maybe a little hypocritical maybe maybe but still healthier than flaunting it Now, if you compare yourself with your mother, the first chief reporter among women, yes. the first war correspondent among women, yes. uh, where would you place yourself vis-a-vis uh, -vis her? I know you were too young when she passed away. No, no, I think she was and remains the abiding influence of my life. I think I became a journalist because of that early exposure to her adventures. and i believe that women like her and women of her generation were the original trailblazers do you think you are as crusading no. uh, journalist as no. she was no i think i'm nowhere as close to as gutsy as she was i think i'm a much more fearful uh, and careful person uh, than my mother i i remember her very vividly and very well even though i was in my teens when she died and she absolutely did not give a damn and i like to believe that i don't give a damn but when i compare myself to her that's a benchmark that just doesn't work. even though you climbed on top of a car to do an interview she jumped into a hippo enclosure to uh, uh, cover a story and she went even to war even though you clung to a ledge when a monkey was biting your ankle no comparison you still think that she was a and, more and, crusading journalist and, and the other women of her generation they they fought battles we just don't have to fight they did but the battles are different today yes but one glass the glass ceiling was first shattered by them now we are cracking 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 making our way up you think you'll remain a crusading journalist for the rest of your life i wanted to be a lawyer so i'll come to you for advice on that so thank you so much i think we must he may have taken away my job here uh, this role reversal thank you so much